Welcome to the Dr. Raj podcast. What is this a podcast of? It's a podcast of happiness and meeting new people and hearing amazing stories. It's about mindfulness. And, you know, one of my favorite things to talk about in the podcast are going to be, you know, diseases that I'm very, very passionate about. And right on the top of that list, it has to be one sarcoidosis. So I love teaming up with the Life and Breath Foundation. In fact, last year, and it's kind of weird, it's been a year already, that uh, we did this podcast uh, last year where we started talking about COVID and sarcoid. And so, hey, this is kind of like the sequel 365 days later. So thank you for everyone joining me. This is live. So hopefully you can actually hear the podcast later on. But with that being said, let's go back to Saul so he could actually MC this for me and get started on the first question. Thank you, Dr. Raj. Okay, I do have a question from Elizabeth. Uh, good question. How do we get complete care from multiple doctors? It seems very difficult to get specialists to communicate with each other. Well, Liz, th that is the question of all questions. And I think that when we think, think about sarcoid, my opening line to anyone is that Sarcoid is not just a disease of the lung. It affects every single organ in the body. And if you were a med student, Liz, I would say, you tell me the organ and I'll tell you what exactly it, uh, could happen to it. Eyes, uveitis, the brain, CNS sarcoid, the heart, myocarditis, pericarditis. So when we talk about sarcoid, it just so happens that pulmonologists like me, most of the time will be the quarterback because the most common organ that affects a sarcoid patient is the lungs, but you got to be good in like internal medicine. You got to be good in family practice and you got to be a good communicator because you already answered your question, which is the hardest part about healthcare is talking to other doctors, talking to other healthcare professionals because communication has got to be great. And I think it's tough when I have a patient that sees me here at USC, but then they have their kidney doctor, a nephrologist at a different hospital, and then they had to get their eye examined at a different hospital. And I'm waiting for these notes and those labs to come to me so I could be a, a kind of a good quarterback. So my advice is as much as possible is to kind of consolidate your care in one place. I think that you gotta pick a provider and doctors that actually like each other, that like to communicate, they're not overwhelmed because it is overwhelming right now in the healthcare system, COVID, all these things, all my staff is out because they're all in some kind of quarantine right now. So it's hard to communicate. But I always would say that I encourage my patients to be their own advocates at all time. And I'm sure some of the patients could relate to me where you come see a doctor for sarcoid, just assume that the doctor doesn't know what sarcoid is. And you bring this like Webster's dictionary of your notes, like, hey, and here are my notes, you know, and sometimes it's overwhelming. I'm like, oh my God, you know, but I think that you have to keep track of your studies, your tests, your questions. And what really impresses me, I do have a couple of patients like this is where, when they want to transfer their care to me, they have like a nice summary list. And some of my patients have had sarcoid for 30, 40 years, and they're so nice to me. They know that I'm not going to flip through every page because of it's just life. But they'll give me the highlights list about what are some big things, what what organs are involved, what was the last note with the doctor. So I think you have to kind of be kind of a doctor yourself. So my advice is simple. I think if you consolidate care, that's going to be great to have everything in the same place. Sometimes being a, an okay doctor isn't how smart you are. It's just, are you willing to talk and go the extra mile to communicate and be your own advocate, take some notes and just kind of know well, uh, kind of your summary, kind of your elevator pitch when you meet your new doctor of where you are now with your sarcoid. So awesome question. And I hope that helped out. Great answer, Dr. Raj. Thank you. Uh, next question, Carolina. What are the long-term effects of anti-inflammatory and immune suppressant medications like Humira or leflunamide? Leflunamide. A pretty good job on that, Saul. I thought we were going to get you on that one, you know? Thank you. Uh, so when I think about immunosuppression, I put them into two broad categories. On one side, I gotta give you the steroids talk, you know what I mean? Then on the other side, we're talking about what we call DMARDs. So someone's gonna say, what is a DMARD? So it's a disease modifying anti-rheumatic medication. 
And DMARDs come in two flavors. There are ones that we call the biological DMARDs and others are called non-biological DMARDs. So if we talk about steroids, now that in itself, if you wanna know what has tons and tons of side effects are those steroids. Now, don't get me wrong, anytime any organ in someone's body who has sarcoid kind of flares up, the first thing you're gonna get are those steroids. And we do need it because when you think about sarcoid, it's an inflammatory disease. These granulomas are inflamed and depending upon where they are, they could cause that, that target organ damage if you don't control that inflammation. So we do need those steroids, but if you haven't noticed, we're always kind of like, you know, taper them off as quickly, quickly, safely, safely as possible. The steroid side effects could be poorly controlled blood sugars, high blood pressure, swelling, osteoporosis, osteopenia, my eyes, I have cataracts, I have glaucoma now because of those steroids. So that in itself is one reason why we use these DMARDs because pound for pound per se, most of us being rheumatologists, pulmonary doctors like myself will say, hey, the side effects of a steroid kind of outweigh most of the side effects of what we call these DMARDs, and we really want to get those steroids down. So now you are really specific. You're like Humira and Lefutamide. That's the generic name, brand name, Arava. So Arava is actually a non-biological DMARD, and Humira, known as generic name Adulinumab, try to say that three times in a row, um, is going to be what we call a tumor necrosis factor inhibitor. So when we talk about a biological DMARD, and those are things like Remicade, you guys call that Infliximab, Humira, Adulinumab, things like Rituximab, all these interleukin-6 inhibitors when we're talking about COVID-19, like Tocilizumab, those are going to have the major side effect of getting those infections. Now, the thing is, is that when I first started practicing sarcoidosis, you know, and seeing patients, I was a little scared to start some of these drugs because I thought I was going to immunosuppress my patients so much, they're just going to walk out of my office with a brand new pneumonia. And that's not true. I think it does weaken your immune system. You are a little more predisposed to getting infections, but in the right patient, the benefits of these drugs outweigh the risks. And I think right now everyone's concerned because let me say the word a thousand times, COVID, COVID, and more COVID, and Omicron variant, and all these things. And of course, when you're on these medications, they do put you at risk. But a lot of the guidelines that we use from the American College of Rheumatology states that, you know, when you think of a patient that has an inflammatory disorder, you know, the it may actually be an un, a disservice to the patient if we don't put them on the right anti-inflammatory medication to control the disease versus just not giving it to them because we're worried about, you know, infections. So before you start many of these medications, specifically when you mentioned, you know, things like uh, Humira, Adalinumab, you got to rule out tuberculosis, you got to rule out viruses like Hep B and which stands for hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And of course, when any of my patients are fighting an infection, I'll hold that medication. Now, when you do Humira, that's a shot. Just let me throw it out there for everyone. Now, leflutamide is not a very common drug I use. Now, the brother of leflutamide is called methotrexate. And I'm sure everyone out there knows what methotrexate is. Now, if you want to get super dorky, uh, methotrexate works when we talk about, you know, DNA synthesis, it works on the purines while leflutamide works on the pyrimidines. So they're really complementary to each other. And the major indication to give leflutamide is if you can't tolerate methotrexate. Now, what is the major thing you can't tolerate about methotrexate to be on leflutamide is that methotrexate sometimes causes some lung issues. I don't see a lot of it because the doses I use for you sarcoid patients are much, much, much lower than the doses of methotrexate that we use for rheumatoid arthritis and definitely lower than for cancers. But if you're getting some lung issues, you might switch to leflutamide. And once again, even though it's not a biologic, hey, it does interact with your immune system. So of course, it's gonna suppress you a little bit when we talk about any type of DMARD, but for infections, probably the biological DMARDs will probably have a little more effect and make you susceptible infections than the non-biologics, but 
those were super specific questions and I really, really liked it because it means you know your care. So awesome job. Oh, Saul, he's not communicating with me. His mute button is on and he's just- Here we go, away. here we go. <laughs> so we have a question from Joni. Will there be, or is there, are they working on a drug just for sarcoidosis? Oh man, so you know what? I wish all these NIH people would just contact me directly and let me know. So the answer is, it's so hard to say a drug just for sarcoid. You know, I don't think there will ever be a drug just for sarcoid. I wish, you know what I mean? Because let me give you some examples. Another disease I see a lot of here at USC is called cystic fibrosis. And that has nothing to do with sarcoid. But, you know, they actually have gene therapy for cystic fibrosis by discovering what gene is involved. And in fact, if you have the med students listening today, it's on chromosome 7, amino acid 508. And we actually have drugs that target the gene. So I love that. Now, when we talk about sarcoid, you know, we don't know what gene is involved. And that's always part of like what causes sarcoid. We know that, hey, I have patients where family members have sarcoid, but I can't tell you exactly what gene, what chromosome, what amino acid. And if we ever find that out, if that's a big part of the cause of sarcoid, then we can do targeted therapy. But when we talk about sarcoid, I kind of think of it uh, with another disease I'm super passionate about called scleroderma. So those are my, my, my two diseases when it comes to autoimmune, sarcoid and scleroderma I do a lot for. And everyone always asks me, is there a disease that actually will treat the scleroderma? And the answer is right now, no. But if you have the renal problems, we treat that. If you have the skin problems, we treat that. Same thing for sarcoid, you know? That's where it's so important to find out where is your sarcoid and monitor your sarcoid and treat it if you're having issues, whether it be with your eyes, the brain, the heart, and of course, the lung. So positive thinking is hopefully one day there will be. I know there's a lot of research going on. The Sarcoidosis Research Foundation is amazing. They're coming up with new things all the time, but not just yet. I know, Al, you gotta hit me up the mute is, button, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> next, next question is from Lynn. She uh, says, I was diagnosed in 1998. Evidence on x-ray with erythema nodosum on legs. No treatment. With cardiac issues in the past year, I asked again to test for it. No evidence on MRI. Should I push for a PET scan? Ooh, wow. You guys are really being specific and, and pushing the envelope. So um interesting so she has loft green syndrome if i heard correctly is that is that right saul you said that initially yes nice so of course you got to define for all the listeners what is loft green syndrome if you read my tips throughout the week loft green syndrome is a triad where you have erythema nodosum which are going to be these painful red bumps historically on the shins. They're not pathognomonic for sarcoid, but for my anyone in the medical field that likes me to go dorky, erythema nodosum can be associated with autoimmune diseases like lupus, infections like fungal infections like coccidioides. So it's very nonspecific. But on top of that, they'll have what's the hilum, which is an area in the lungs, the lymph nodes will be enlarged, you know, and they can also have an inflammatory arthritis somewhere. So this classic triad, you know what I mean, uh, was so niche towards sarcoid that presenting with this acutely, you can almost have a 90 to 95% sensitivity and specificity of making the right diagnosis of sarcoid. Now, with that being said, you know, because it's not 100% and, you know, what can mimic this? We said infections, maybe even cancer sometimes. If I'm going to treat anyone for loft greens using, you know, biologics or non-biologics or DMARDs or steroids, I really prefer getting a tissue diagnosis just in case. Now, back to her question, the heart. Now, there are three organs that are always the most important that I will treat and go out of my way to diagnose if they're going to be involved. Number one, the brain. Number two, the eyes. And number three, 
where is my heart? There it is. <laughs> Number three, the heart, you know, and because if sarcoid is there, you know, um, you could get some rare, very, very bad clinical consequences. So number one, if I'm going to evaluate cardiac sarcoid, I think one of my slides says it starts off with ECG first, which is kind of like the electrical activity of the heart. Start off with an echocardiogram. But if you want to know if the heart's involved, you just kind of go around biopsying the heart. It's not like a fun thing to do and it has its risks. So there are two imaging modalities out there. There is an MRI and then there's a cardiac PET CT scan. And studies have been shown one is better than the other. Sometimes we choose one versus the other based upon the patient. Let's say if it's an MRI, if you have hardware and metal in your body, I can't put you in an MRI machine, you know? And there are certain characteristics that we see, whether it's an MRI or a cardiac PET CT, to may indicate that there could be inflammation in the heart. So I think the first thing you have to ask your doctor is that how much does he or she believe that the heart's involved? That's gonna be important. Number two, I mean, you should be seeing a cardiologist. Number three, maybe does that cardiologist you know, see a lot of sarcoid patients. I think that's one of the first things that my patients ask me when I send them to a specialist. Sure, Dr. Raj, you're sending me to a neurologist, but have they seen sarcoid before? So you may want to find out that. And number, the last thing I was going to say is how is that going to change your management? Are they treating you already? And would that result change therapy or not? So these are going to be important questions to ask. But if you're concerned, I think the first thing to do is communicate with your doctor that, you know, you need more confidence that an MRI is negative. But in my opinion, a negative MRI or a negative PET CT scan, that's pretty good. They're both very equivalent when we talk about showing if there's inflammation in the heart or not. Great answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next question from Linda. I have a lesion on my sacrum and one adjacent on my iliac crest. Does this mean sarcoid is in my bone marrow as well? Really super good question. So when we talk about, you know, ulcers or pressure ulcers in the sacrum, which is your behind over there, you know, it sounds like these are going to be, you know, areas where when we sleep, when we lay down, when we're sitting, you're, you're really prone to have it. And when you have these ulcers or skin lesions in these areas, you know, it really is dealing with the skin itself, you know? And when I, when I heard that question, the first thing I always tell all my patients is that, you know, not everything that happens has to be from sarcoid. And it's kind of, it's harsh to say that to some people because, you know, I get a lot of referrals and they're like, my sarcoid is causing this and that, and you don't want to be negative and you don't want to be uh, ever doubting what they feel is causing a, a someone's symptoms. But remember, sarcoid is rare and most people with sarcoid, you know, they really don't need me. I mean, they just, most of my patients come see me just to give me a high five nowadays knuckles and just, hey, some active surveillance because most people with sarcoid do super, super, super well. And they live their entire life without a flare. So I would say that if someone has heartburn, it's probably because you're eating chocolate and caffeine and tomatoes before going to bed, <laughs> you know? And it's not because it's a sarcoid. So I always think about, you know, common things first. But what you're asking is going to be, is the bone marrow involved based upon the skin lesion? And the answer is probably not, you know, because just because the superficial skin, the soft tissues involved, doesn't mean the bone marrow is involved. Does sarcoid involve the bone marrow? Definitely, you know what I mean? But that's not one of the most common presentations. And what does it do in the bone marrow? Well, in most cases, it's just there and we find it accidentally. And that's, I think, the take-home message for anyone with sarcoid is that, you know, if sarcoid is in one organ, it probably is somewhere else, but if it's not causing symptoms, we probably won't do anything. So for the bone marrow, what does the bone marrow produce are three main cell lines, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. And most of my patients, as long as they're not going to be having severe anemia, or thrombocytopenia, which is low platelets, or leukopenia, which is low white blood cell count, I probably wouldn't do anything. And even if you have a low white blood cell count, if you're not being predisposed to infection after infection, you're just kind of low on the, the WBC count a little bit, I probably wouldn't do anything. And to get super dorky, 
when you research patients with sarcoid and you look at the cell lines of the WBCs, many patients with sarcoid will have an isolated lymphopenia. So there's different types of cell lines and your lymphocytes may be a little bit low, but just because it's low doesn't mean I'm gonna slam you with steroids and put you on other drugs. So remember, it's always gonna be in what context? Is it causing symptoms? Because like someone asked in the beginning, many times in sarcoid, if you don't find the right doctor, the treatments are worse than just watching, you know? So, and I have a really, and I'm a real big proponent because of my wife, who's a rheumatologist, that we both believe that people don't wanna be on chronic medications. We really do believe that. So if there's no indication to treat, I wouldn't. To answer your question specifically, I don't think that it means your bone marrow is involved. So I would kind of default to common things are common and talk to your doctor if you have more questions. Great, thank you. Uh, Teresa has a question. I have Lofgren syndrome and although acute, I suffer from inflammation. Do you have any advice? Oh, definitely. So of course, you know, the I think that we're referring to is the arthritis. You know what I mean? The erythema nodosum is a little painful. And for most times, you know, of course you want to treat the underlying cause. If it's from a fungus, use some antifungals. If it's from tuberculosis, treat the TB. From sarcoid, you know, I usually do what's called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. That's your ibuprofen. And anytime you use these ibuprofens and Advils and naprosins, there's two organs you always got to be careful of. And the two organs is the stomach because you worry about developing ulcers. That's why a lot of these non-steroidal medications gives you what they call peptic ulcer disease. And you worry about the kidney. So those are the two things I worry about. There's always going to be the recommended dose that you shouldn't exceed. But most of the time for erythema dosum, those skin lesions will kind of respond to that. Now, I, mean, I think you guys are referring about the arthritis. So inflammatory arthritis can be really, really painful. And the inflammatory arthritis in sarcoid can almost mimic rheumatoid arthritis, you know? And we use, as you can tell, when we talk about drugs, many of the drugs that we use for rheumatoid arthritis kind of carry over and we borrow them for our sarcoid patients. So I think it's very important that if you have specific joints that are gonna be involved, you need to tell your physician. Questions that they'll love to ask is morning stiffness. So when we have inflammatory joint disease, the doctors will always ask in the morning, it's all right to have stiff, fingers and joints for maybe 10, 15 minutes. But if you start having morning stiffness for like an hour, two hours, that's not normal. They'll do a physical exam. They'll look for what they call synovitis, which is inflammation of the joint. Is it boggy? Is it tender? Is it red? Is there possibly fluid in the joint that they have to aspirate? So if that happens for a lot greens, well, they may consider using steroids. And if it doesn't, uh, respond to steroids, then uh oh, we may have to start using what we call these DMARDs, you know? And many of the DMARDs that we talk about, especially the non biological DMARDs, a methotrexate, a loflutamide, an imuran, a Celsep, a hydroxychloroquine, they don't work overnight. Most of these, you know, medications take six to eight weeks just to kick in. And in those cases, that's why steroids work quick. Or someone mentioned earlier Humira, these TNF inhibitors, they work relatively quick too. So it really depends on how painful the lesions are, risk factors, drug, drug interactions. So all these things factor in when uh, trying to treat symptoms. Great, thank you. Uh, Margaret has a question. She says, this may sound strange, but I don't know what kind of sarcoidosis I have. I have problems with vision and inflammation in my eyes. My wonderful uveitis specialist sent me for testing and scans. Numerous and large lymph nodes were found in my chest area. A biopsy was done and it turned out to be sarcoidosis. So what kind of sarcoidosis do I have or doesn't it really matter? No, that, that, that's great. And so let's just keep it simple. So not many times that one of the presenting findings of sarcoid or in general could be the eye involvement, you know, and when we talk about uveitis, you know, uveitis does have many subtypes and I'm not going to pretend to be an ophthalmologist or a, a, retin, a retinal specialist. But there's anterior uveitis, which many people experience. That's when you have what's called light sensitivity, 
photophobia. You could have findings of redness in the eye. When you they look at your pupil, which is the black part of the eye, it could be irregular. It looks like you have what's called a ciliary flush, where you see redness right around the eyes. So anterior uveitis is painful, and that will spawn you to go to an ophthalmologist or an eye doctor. Also, you could have what's called posterior uveitis, where you may not feel anything. And that's why many of these doctors want to dilate your pupil and look in the back of your eye. Now, uveitis in itself is not pathognomonic, and that's a word that means niched only to sarcoid. Other causes of uveitis could be infections. I, I mean it, you know, and that's what's scary about it because if you think it's sarcoid, they'll either give you, you know, topical steroid drops or blast you with steroids if it's posterior, but you wanna make sure it's not an infection or something else that can make the infection worse. So I think that your physician made a wonderful call, not just treating the uveitis, but finding out what's the underlying cause. And that's where I get many of my consults where they go to the ophthalmologist first, they see uveitis and the question is, well, why? And then they send them to me and it sounds like they did the right thing because if they're gonna be treating you, you wanna get a biopsy diagnosis. And they went for the mediastinum, it sounds like, which is gonna be right in the chest area. And they saw the magical words. The magical words are non-caseating granulomas. And you put that in the right clinical setting and you have sarcoid. So when I think of sarcoid, there is not really type A or type B or type C. Sarcoid is sarcoid. It's very important to categorize, you know, where the sarcoid is, but don't get confused about syndromes. You know what I mean? What is the syndrome if I opened up a medical textbook? It's just a constellation of findings and we call it a syndrome, you know, but it doesn't change the underlying management. It's just giving you a name for a constellation of findings. For example, Lofgren syndrome, it's just sarcoid. But if you have these three findings in the acute setting, I call it Lofgren's. And there are other syndromes out there and the one associated with uveitis called Herdford Waldenstrom syndrome. And you don't even have to write that down. It doesn't offend me. It just means you have the different findings and you clump it together. So when I hear your story, it's not important to call it a certain type of sarcoid because sarcoid is sarcoid. They made the right diagnosis. They did it in the right way. They know what's causing your uveitis and hopefully you're gonna be on the right treatment. So hopefully that answered your question good. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, Next question from Karen. How does sarcoidosis affect the stomach and appetite and what can help? Also, does excruciating pain relate to sarcoidosis? Thank you. Yeah, no, so those are very, very practical questions, you know. So number one, it all really depends upon where is your sarcoid. Now, okay, if you told me that, you know, appetite and sarcoid are directly related very commonly? The answer is no, not at all. You know what I mean? Where does sarcoid affect? Lung, lung, and more lung. And what does it do in the lung? Nothing, it just sits there and you shoot a chest x-ray and all of a sudden everyone's panicking. Oh my God, did you see what was on that x-ray? You're like, no, what was on there, you know? And so it's usually asymptomatic. Now, can sarcoid affect what's called the GI tract? Of course it does, but a very small amount and it really doesn't like the stomach too much at all. So when I hear, you know, difficulty eating or swallowing or taste or appetite, I mean, there are so many things you need to do under the title of common things are common. And you gotta put your healthcare provider on the spot and say, what makes you think it's gonna be sarcoid? You know, and that's the hardest part. Now, medications could definitely cause that. You know, I mean, if you're on steroids, there's a lot of weight gain that, that occurs with it. Definitely sarcoid can affect your appetite. I mean, steroids can affect your appetite in different ways. You know, if you're on a lot of non steroidal medications, you may develop an ulcer secondary to being on them. So I think we need more information about appetite in itself. So, and Saul, so what was the next thing besides appetite? That was the question. There was one more thing. Uh, pain, excuse me. Pain, pain. ooh, and, and you know, and once again, can sarcoid cause pain? Of course, I would be like a foolish doctor not to say it can, and it depends where it is. Is a sarcoid the granulomas on a nerve? Is it on some place that really can cause pain? Is it right up against the lung next to the pleura when you're breathing, it hurts? I mean, of course it can. Is it right on the bone in your spine? But the question now becomes, how do you know, doctor, that it's from the sarcoid? Is there imaging findings that indicate that? You mean, uh, are you working it up? So 
I think one of my favorite questions, you know, it, that I encourage my patients to ask is always, why? Why do you think that? Now, when I'm a doctor, sometimes I get a little scared. There's too many whys, but that's what you do need to ask. And it's not wrong if a doctor says, one of my favorite answers is, I don't know. I think I use the word I don't know quite often throughout the day. And I like to explain why I don't know, what are the options, will it change my management, what imaging is available or not available. But I think, you know, that's another thing when someone was talking about the first question we had, it goes back to communicating. Do you trust your doctor? Is he going to communicate? Is he going to refer me to someone who knows better? And I am just my personality. I think sarcoid is a rare disease and I am always you know, pro someone getting a second opinion or a third opinion. And even though I, most people come to me for those opinions, I definitely encourage, there's, trust me, there's a lot of smarter people than me out there. And I'll do the same thing if we don't come to an agreement just to make sure I didn't miss anything. So I hope this answers your question, but that was a good question. Great answer, thank you. Uh, next question from Shireen. How long can you have inflammation around the eyes and the lacrimal glands before it causes real damage? You know, I really wish I did more rotations in ophthalmology and med school for tonight, you know. <laughs> but uh, so the answer is the lacrimal glands are the glands that uh, produce the uh, lubrication in the eye itself, you know. And anytime there is active inflammation in the eye, that's serious. That's where the most important person for me is going to be the ophthalmologist, you know, and someone said retinal specialist. And why a retinal specialist? Because you got to look in the back of the eye. You definitely worry about things like pan uveitis, retinal vasculitis. Um, so the minute there's inflammation, we got to be aggressive. You know, we usually like to start therapy with topical steroids, usually for anterior uveitis, you know, and uveitis is uh, the uvea itself, everyone is not a structure. There's not like, here's my uvea, you know, the uvea is made of the iris, which is the colors of the eyes. It's made of the ciliary bodies and part of the back of the eye called a choroid, you know, and that's why you need to have the eye doctor. And if any of those things are infl is inflamed, you definitely need to control that. So they try to do it with topical steroids first, if not uh, systemic steroids, meaning through the mouth. And certain DMARDs have data when it comes to the eyes. And medications I'm referring to are things like um, adalinumab, which is Humira, infliximab, which is Remicade, they just have good studies when it comes to the eyes. So I, if you are having continued inflammation, I think it's a time to be aggressive and ask your ophthalmologist, well, what's our game plan? What's the next steps? That's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next question comes from Melissa. I have a strange rash, mostly on my limbs, near joints that itch beyond imagination. Biopsy showed granulomas. Any advice? Yeah, and you know, once again, you know, if there was not a history or a physical examination, or I can't see you and all you're telling me is, hey, I have a granuloma, that in itself does not diagnose sarcoid. And, you know, the first thing I would say, tr you know, trying to be a good clinician is when you say granulomas, remember there's two types there's what we call a caseating granuloma and a non-caseating. So a caseating granuloma makes me think a lot of infection. You know what I mean? And if it's non-caseating, there's even a broader differential than just sarcoid. So people are going to ask me why or what is it? And it could be occupational lung disease, like something called borreliosis. It could be sometimes we see poorly formed granulomas in the lung disease called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Sometimes we see non-casing granulomas associated with malignancy sometimes. So the reason why I'm saying that is that just finding a granuloma does not mean, hey, you got sarcoid. And I think that's one of the biggest things that clinicians need to make it clear that just the granuloma in itself doesn't equal sarcoidosis. It's the history, the physical examination, and putting the puzzle together. So I would say you need to ask your healthcare provider, how did you piece this together that I have sarcoid, you know? And so with that being said, I'll give you one of my tips because sarcoid is such a rare disease you know, my job as a clinician is to get as many pieces of the sarcoid puzzle as possible to make the right diagnosis. So pieces of my puzzle to help you get a diagnosis definitely includes the biopsy, which is the gold standard, but maybe the history, maybe some labs, maybe some imaging studies, 
all these things go together to complete the puzzle because you've got to make sure it's the right diagnosis because once again, sarcoid is not a common disorder that you can start throwing down that diagnosis left and right. And if you do that, you start blasting everyone with steroids. Once again, a misdiagnosis and side effects from the medication. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question from Deborah. Uh, what should be done when an opacity shows up in part of your lung when you have a CT scan? Oh, great question. You know, and this is a problem just in society in general, because, you know, when I'm teaching medical school, I make this joke <laughs> that, you know, you go to the emergency emergency department, you know, for a urinary tract infection, and you know what they're going to do? We're going to get a CT of your chest. <laughs> and so my medical students laugh at that joke. And the whole thing is, is that, you know, everyone gets a CT of the chest nowadays, no matter what. And when you get a CT of the chest, you're going to find things you want to find and things you don't. And that's why, you know, it's very important that when you're wondering, should I get a CT of the chest? Be careful of the things that just may pop up. And we see a lot of incidental nodules. And when you ha have a nodule in the lung, the first thing you want to do is always ask your clinician, is there an old image from the past? Meaning that, hey, did you shoot an x-ray last year or two years ago or 10 years ago? So the first thing I do is ask for old images because if that nodule existed 10 years ago and it's the same size, dude, we're done. There's nothing to do, you know what I mean? But if it just appeared after an x-ray from, let's say a month ago, hey, probably gonna be infectious. Cancer don't appear overnight, like boom, there it is probably gonna be infectious, you know what I mean? So, but if you have an old x-ray maybe six months ago and it's growing, uh-oh, you do gotta think of the big C cancer and a different workup has had. So I think the first thing to do is to take a deep breath. You know, that's why it's good to keep all your images, keep all the studies you had, let the doctor know that you had previous images. I'll go out of my way to try to find these images, you know? And then if you already have a diagnosis of sarcoid, that's a good thing because sarcoid actually could present with nodules in the lung. It's very, very, very common to just have nodules in the lung with sarcoid. Now, this is gonna to lead to another thing I do, which is active surveillance, because a nodule in the lung could be from sarcoid. I'm not gonna go around and start biopsying every nodule because that's kind of painful. But if you have a nodule in the lung, and especially if you're a smoker, don't smoke, you're gonna buy yourself probably a surveillance CT once a year because there's no guarantees that that nodule, unless I go around biopsying every nodule, that's a stupid idea, you know, is, you know, just to make sure it's not gonna be from malignancy. So I always do active surveillance and people have lung nodules just to make sure everything is okay. And I know you didn't ask this, but someone's gonna ask it. They're gonna say, I'm gonna guess right now, Dr. Raj, uh-huh. What about a PET scan for this nodule? So the answer is no, uh, you shouldn't get a PET scan because when you do a PET scan, a PET scan is good for one thing, that's metabolically active tissue. And sarcoid nodules and cancers are both metabolically active. So what does that mean to you is that if you do a PET scan, they're both gonna light up. And if they're both gonna light up, then I'm like, well, it could be sarcoid, it could be cancer, then I'm gonna have to go do a biopsy anyways. So the key thing is a PET scan won't distinguish sarcoid from any other type of infection or malignancy. You know, doctor, you just took the next, I swear you took the next question from Sandra. Is a PET <laughs> scan the only sure way to know if the sarcoid is active or in remission? Oh man, so we got a thing going, man. I, I gotta tell you that, dude. Is that, is that crazy? <laughs> it's so, crazy. The other <laughs> uh, and now Vanishka has a question. How much time does it take for sarcoidosis to go away? No, that, that's a great question. And, you know, I'm going to be like Debbie Downer right now because sarcoid never goes away. And it's my job to actually look at my patients in their eyes and say, it's never going away. You know what I mean? But always remember the positive side is that most people don't even realize they have sarcoid and live their entire life. Most people that have sarcoid, here's the situation. They get an x-ray to do a preoperative evaluation before an elective surgery or something else, and they see the hilum of the lungs is kind of enlarged, or they see a nodule, or let's say they have a surgery and they find a granuloma somewhere. It's always a oops 
it, I, I, you have sarcoid. And so just realize that most people get the diagnosis, they're going to live longer than me. So that's pretty cool, you know. But, you know, I think that because you can't take that risk, that's why you do see a specialist. That's why we do active surveillance. That's why I always ask about the eyes and the brain and the heart because you just don't know. So the thing is, is that the word I use, and if I have a patient who has active sarcoid, my favorite word is remission. So when I think about sarcoid, I use the same words that my wife uses with lupus and rheumatoid arthritis, is that it's going to be exacerbations and remissions. And my job is to put you in remission. And if I could put you in remission up front through a, a quick burst of steroid, that's one of the best prognostic signs. If I can't put you in remission through steroids and I have to use drug B and C, well, it still could happen, but it's going to be a tougher sarcoid to deal with. So you're always going to have sarcoid. It's never going to go away. But if you follow the recommendations of your doctor, ask good questions that you could probably go on remission and live a happy full life. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, new question, new person. Eddie asks, can us long haulers not on meds who had it for 15 or 20 years live to a ripe old age and not ever require supplemental oxygen. Oh, great question. And I love how we stole the, the phrase long haulers now. You know what I mean? I thought that was a, like a COVID phrase. You know what I mean? <laughs> I guess they didn't, they didn't reserve the rights for that. But, you know, the answer is yes. And I think this question is very timely right after the last questions because, you know, like I said, most of my patients that see me, I have patients who are 70 plus, you know, I always tell them, you know, you really don't have to see me that often. I think they just love to come say hi and they love just to chat, tell me about what their grandkids are doing. And that's all I really do. I don't do anything for them, you know, because you could definitely live a very long age. And just because it's in your lung doesn't mean it's going to have inflammation in your lung. So remember, your chest is divided into the lung parenchyma itself, the body of the lung, the sponges and the lymph nodes in the chest, we call that area the mediastinum. If you just have some lymph node involvements or a nodule, that's fine. There are people who have lung sarcoid, we call that pulmonary sarcoid, that go on to develop fibrosis. Now that's bad. And I would never downplay how horrible it is if you have pulmonary fibrosis secondary to sarcoid. That stinks. And do I have patients that make me cry all the time? You know, I have, I could think right now about a female who's in her 50s that has, you know, pulmonary fibrosis, secondary to sarcoid. She was on every steroid known to man. I can't even taper her off the steroids because if I go below 10 or 15 milligrams, she gets short of breath, you know, and uh, I have her evaluated for lung transplant, which is what I do for anyone who has pulmonary fibrosis, you know, but, you know, one of the things, back to your question, Yes, you could live forever. And well, maybe not forever, but you could live a very long life, you know. But one thing I did want to say was that, you know, there is a medication out there now that got FDA approval for pulmonary fibrosis secondary to sarcoid. Now, I guess I could say the name of the, the brand name of the drug is OFEV. And OFEV actually got FDA approval for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but then through other studies, it got approved for many rheumatological diseases, including sarcoid. And this is not a medication that reverses fibrosis, but it slows down the progression of the fibrosis. So, of course, I make it sound so awesome, and you're going to call up your doctor, hey, what about this OFEV? Now, remember, <laughs> every medication's got side effects, including this one. And, you know, right off the bat, I could tell you that when you take this medication for pulmonary fibrosis secondary to sarcoid, it doesn't make you feel better. It's not like, oh my God, I feel great. No, it just slows down the decline of lung function, but it'll give you lots of diarrhea. So <laughs> I'll take you that much. And of course, if it sounds cool and new, it's gotta be expensive. But the reason why I brought this up is that this is why it's always good to follow up with your primary care, a sarcoid specialist, because new things are coming up and you never know what you might miss. And if you're one of those people that unfortunately has you know, fibrosis, secondary to sarcoid. Hey, this is something you could ask your physician to see if you may be a candidate for this. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Dr. Raj, your favorite again. We're going back to the eyes. All right. <laughs> <Shireen>. <laughs> <laughs> she, 
should have gone to yeah. To, you know, to, you know. yeah. Anyway, how would you be able to really know which autoimmune disease is attacking the eyes? I've been diagnosed with ankylosis, spondylitis, sarcoidosis, and now they're thinking Sjogren's since I have chronic dry eyes. What medicine in this case would you recommend when the MRI shows that it's swelling in the lacrimal gland and outer area and white matter on the brain? Oh, man. You know, for once, I actually feel confident in asking this question. So the only reason I could answer this question, whoever asked it, is because my wife's a rheumatologist. And my wife's way smarter than me. So she deals with ankylosing spondylitis, Sjogren's, and lupus. So and the re how do you diagnose what it is? You already know the answer. You don't even need me here. That sarcoid is the only one that when you biopsy, you see what, everyone? Non-caseating granulomas. You know what I mean? You don't see non-caseating granulomas in Sjogren's and in uh, ankylosing spondylitis and lupus. And then on top of that, remember my analogy is the puzzle. Every disease you just mentioned is rare. So if you talk about ankylosing spondylitis, this is going to be a disease that affects the low back. You get a lot of low back pain. Your butt, it's called gluteal. You get butt pain. It's really hard to walk. They'll shoot an x-ray of your iliac uh, crest and your spine looking for a sacroiliitis. Plus, they're going to order all these different labs to make the diagnosis, you know. Uh, Sjogren's is more than just I have dry eyes and dry mouth. That's a classic thing you think about, but Sjogren's can also affect every organ in the body. In fact, Sjogren's, for those of you who like to be dorky, mimics um, sarcoid because they both affect the parotid glands. And in fact, I'm bringing this all together, dude. I'm going to pat myself on the back that there is something called Herdfort Waldenstrom syndrome that we just talked about. Herdfort Waldenstrom syndrome is uveitis and parotid gland enlargement. And that's where in the olden days that, it, you know, they would confuse Sjogren's with sarcoid. But Sjogren's, once again, you could biopsy and see other things, but there's also antibodies that sarcoid is not an autoimmune disease. We don't order ANA for sarcoid. We don't order for Sjogren's anti-RO, anti-LA, SSA, SSB. They're not going to be for sarcoid. So, but the take home message is always going to be this, is that I think you need to ask your healthcare provider, my favorite word, why? Why do you think it's sarcoid? Why can't it be something else? And maybe sometimes it's tough for, you know, the clinician to explain what I just did because, you know, it's a little confusing, but that's what you're asking. And it's a very good question because even though there's a lot of overlap with the drugs we use for sarcoid and a lot of these room diseases, you know, it's still nice to know what you got. So hopefully that answers, and for your dry eyes, well, if they think it's Sjogren's, well, the common thing to do for Sjogren's is just help you out, where it's gonna be some artificial tears, you know, there's topical, topical medications, there's procedures like lacrimal uh, gland occlusion. So there's definitely a lot out there, be sure to ask. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jimmy has a question. After mm -hmm. stopping treatment for cardiac sarcoidosis, uh, have you seen reoccurrence after a certain period of time? Well, I'm, I'm like loving these questions. So, you know, once again, the three organs that I always, always pay extra special attention about is the brain, the eyes, and the heart. And if you have sarcoid involvement in any of these organs, I will probably err on keeping you on some kind of DMARD, disease modifying anti rheumatic drug. Why is because if that organ flares up again, it's the heart, it's the eye, it's your brain. I would love the benefits of keeping you on a medication to keep the inflammation at bay sometimes outweighs the risk of the side effects of the medication. So if you had heart involvement, you know, most of us will probably keep you on methotrexate. That's what the data says. And then, you know, going back to the data and the drugs, you know, there I mean, there's really not any FDA approved drugs for sarcoid. It stinks, huh? There's really not a lot of robust data comparing, you know, methotrexate to leflutamide or Humira to Remicade or these things. So we have to use our experience, the data that we do have. But for most of the time, if you had heart involvement, I probably would keep you on some kind of DMARD. And the easiest one for me is always methotrexate. And people are going to say, why? Well, you take it 
once a week, which is kind of cool, you know? And my wife always says, you should make them take it on Monday so they won't forget. I'm like, why? You could call it methotrexate Monday. I'm like, oh, all right, <laughs> you know? You take folic acid once a day. We monitor your liver and CBC every three to four months. And it's just been around forever, so we feel very comfortable using it. And if you're on methotrexate, usually my go-to dose is somewhere between 10 to 20 milligrams weekly folic acid daily. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next question we have, when I went to the hospital for my liver poisoning, none of the doctors knew what sarcoidosis was. They had to call a hospitalist to care for me. How can I change this? Oh, I think we're doing it right now, right? So Ellen, this is how we're changing it, right? It's all about raising awareness. And I'm not gonna be pointing the fingers because I mean, if someone had a cough and my med student told me that the most common cause of it is sarcoid. I'm like, that's not right, medical student. It's a pneumonia. Right now it's COVID. It could be asthma and GERDs or postnasal drip. Common things are always common. And, you know, when we think about sarcoid, you know, it, it wasn't until I committed part of my life to being an advocate for sarcoid patients that I realized that, wow, there's so much knowledge out there, but unless you're invested in it, unless you have patience with it, you may not realize it. But I would, I do respect the doctor, or nurse practitioner or PA that said, I don't know sarcoid, because if you don't know, you don't know. And I give more credit for getting someone who knows it. That takes a lot of courage. Thank you. I uh, just have a few more questions left. Yeah. Uh, question from Heather, does calcium increase growth of granulomas? Oh, man, that was one of the best questions in the whole world. So, uh, so my wife and I, if you haven't noticed, I love my wife, you know, and so one of the things she takes care of is osteoporosis and osteopenia. So one of the questions we always bounce off each other is, well, if you're a sarcoid patient, should you be taking vitamin D and calcium? And the answer is, totally, because I think that there's this misnomer, can you have elevated calcium from sarcoid? Sure, it does happen in some cases. Someone's gonna ask me why, is because if you have inflamed granulomas, it converts vitamin D to the active form and it kind of raises serum calcium. Just because your serum calcium is a little elevated, does it mean to panic? Does it mean I'm gonna blast you with steroids? The answer is no. You just probably have what's called asymptomatic hypercalcemia. But if you start developing renal stones and pancreatitis and all these manifestations, sure, we want to address it. But when we talk about just because calcium is high, I'll tell you one thing, when you get older, especially if you're a woman, especially if you're over the age of 60, you know what I'm going to be worried about is osteoporosis. And I could see so many people not getting their bone scans. I mean, I'm sorry, DEXA scans. You got to get that DEXA scan and you got to make sure that vitamin D level is at the right place. Vitamin D deficiency is so common. You know, even here in California, I don't know how we can be vitamin deficient in California. There's so much sunlight, but we are, you know? So I see many sarcoid patients scared to take vitamin D. All you got to do is tell your doctor, please check my level. And if the level's low, you take vitamin D. Taking some calcium is gonna be totally okay. So, but I think these are really good questions. There are a few exceptions, and this is where you can talk to your primary doctor, talk to your sarcoid doctor, but if you wanna take it up a notch when it comes to calcium, osteoporosis, osteopenia, it's gonna be an endocrinologist or rheumatologist. Great, thank you. Last question. <laughs> uh, what is your biggest piece of advice you'd give sarcoidosis patients? Oh, you know what? I might even steal one I used last year. And the biggest piece of advice is always, you know, realize that you are not alone. And what do I mean by that is that, you know, I'm, I love being on social media, you know, it's one of my favorite things to do. And, you know, when we were doing this Life and Breath Foundation talk, I kind of looked up all the different, you know, people who are, you know, who have their own sarcoidosis foundations and groups and the get togethers. And, you know, when I have a new patient that's diagnosed, it's overwhelming. And I will be the first to say I have patients that tear up when they get this diagnosis. And when the minute I tell them that there are other people out there that share some of the things that you're going through despite being a rare disease, it really provides some comfort. And, you know, I wish I could name every single group that's out there that supports me, that supports other patients. So my advice to everyone who knows someone who has sarcoid or is suffering from sarcoid, realize that you're not alone. And that's why groups like the Life and Breath Foundation exist 
to connect you with all these people. And in a weird way, you know, I have my family, it's my wife, and my three kids, but I have my sarcoidosis family and I love them very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Raj. This has been a very lively educational session. I think we all learned a lot. I know that a lot of the comments came in and uh, how approachable and how easy it is to listen to your answers. So I really appreciate it. Appreciate everybody uh, listening in today. Thank you very much for participating. And we look forward to seeing you all next month. Bye, everyone. Good night.